So it's, uh, it's interesting because the f- for the first day, uh, you know, talking about digital violence prevention in Africa, I thought it was interesting to see how, uh, even though we're talking about prevention uh, of, you know, uh, of, of violence, we had a bit of conversation around, you know, the action of some governments uh, that are using prevention of crisis uh, as an opportunity to clamp down uh, either on dissenting voices or on civil society uh, in particular. And and what, what, I, what I found interesting also, I mean, I've also found the, the poll uh, on the first day uh, interesting. Uh, I think people are very optimistic uh, I think one thing we can say about the people who participated over the last three days is that they are very uh, optimistic. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that may not be disconnected from the fact that these are people who are working on the ground. Uh, so the only reason why you will engage with an issue anyway uh, is because you want to make changes uh, you know, in, in that area. Uh, as, as you may guess, uh, the second day was uh, um, a bit more interesting for me uh, because uh, of, of recent events, uh, you know, digitalization opportunities for African democracies. I, I wasn't surprised to see that the poll was a bit less than today. Uh, today we were in the, you know, in the late, low, you know, higher 90s. Uh, yesterday was about 66%. It was about two thirds of the people who believe uh, that you know, digitalization can help uh, when it comes to African democracies. And I particularly found the, an example from Ghana uh, interesting because there's, there's a whole lot going on uh, where a lot of young people and not, you know, some not so young, uh, using technology as an opportunity to engage in a political process that would otherwise uh, have estranged them. When we, you know, got the demo, uh, I mean, the presentation about the the tool that was used in Ghana, uh, where you know there were 19 parliamentarians who had said nothing uh, throughout the four years of parliament, uh, and the information was put out there, and 12 of them lost their seats. Uh, of course, we know it's not only because of that, you know, of that work, uh, but I think it will get people asking questions. Uh, you know, if, if people didn't know in the first place that, you know, this is the work of parliamentarians, now they know this is this is what they're supposed to do to discuss issues. How do you discuss issues without opening your mouth uh, in, in parliament? And, and the reason why yesterday was very uh, interesting for me was also uh, because of what I, I see as, you know, the history of the role that tech has played in politics on the continent. And, you know, uh, a few examples were made yesterday, for example, um, you know, uh, the mention was made of Yenamare, uh, one, one of the protests, uh, but I was in 2012, even before then, uh, as far back as 2010. And I, you know, I said to people that, you know, when we began to see the number of internet users on the continent begin to rise, we also began to see people finding uh, their voice also on digital media platforms, not because they didn't have a voice before, but because that voice, it was tough to speak through a newspaper. First of all, if you spoke to a newspaper, that article may not appear the next day. Uh, even if it's published, it may be ceased. Uh, you know, when I was in the university, I remember there was a major publication uh, that we were sure was going to be released on a Sunday. And on Sunday morning, when we went to the newsstand to pick this, uh, it was the Newswatch magazine uh, to pick this copy, it had been bought completely or seized completely by the military government at the time. Uh, so you could go on TV uh, to, you know, to speak and then midway during the conversation, uh, the, you know, regulatory commission says, hey, you're, you're speaking to, you know, too much about politics, you need to slow down a bit and things like that. But on social media, people have found a way to express themselves, uh, you know, and, and I think this is not just in Africa. Uh, we will remember um, you know, the Arab Spring and all of the roles that technology played around 2010. Uh, in 2011, for example, and I, and I love to give this example uh, in Nigeria, where typically uh, when elections are completed, you have to wait uh, for observers to get back to their stations and tally what they've seen and things like that. But for the first time, a lot of citizens were able to follow the process, take pictures at the polling units, you know, do some, you know, 
voter tabulation and come to an idea of what could be, uh, you know, what it, an eventual result could be like. And participation, of course, increased a bit. And I suspect that was one of the reasons why by 2012, you had uh, one of those popular hashtags called Occupy Nigeria uh, that translated, of course, onto the streets. Uh, around the same time was when you had the Yenamare uh, in Senegal where rappers, activists, artists and journalists were just fed up uh, with you know, President Wadi at the time who was seeking a third term. Uh, in the same year, uh, in October, we saw the same scenario with uh, Alpha Conde, uh, his third attempt uh, in, in Guinea. And in 2014, at the same time, when you had the hashtag for bring back our girls in Nigeria, which was citizens basically saying to government, you're not doing your work. You're supposed to find these 300 girls that were kidnapped uh, by terrorists. And at about the same time, we're beginning to see, you know, you know, uh, the a similar protest, uh, but not for the same uh, issue. Uh, Sassofid and Le Bas, uh, you know, in, uh, in, uh, you saw also for Burkina Faso, where there was a lot of social media campaign around the, of course, the work that was being done by President Compare at the time. Uh, you could go to 2015 when we had the Feast Must Fall. Uh, 2016 was a unique year for me uh, because that was when Gambia has decided. Uh, was a popular thing. Uh, a dictator for so many years, and suddenly, uh, I'm glad to see fix the country. I'll get to 2021. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know uh, that, was, that was 2016. But, you know, you had, between 2016 and now, we've had Zimbabwean Lives Matter, Congo is bleeding, shut it all down Namibia, end Anglophone crisis in, you know, in Cameroon, and you had NSAS protests uh, in Nigeria in October last year. And of course, this year, you've had uh, fix the country uh, in Ghana. So definitely, I'll I was coming to that. But, but the important thing that we've seen is that as more citizens get online, yes, only about 39%, uh, depending on what number you're quoting, only about 39% are online. But even with that 39%, there has been so much pressure in the political space that many governments are now reacting by shutting down the internet. Look at Uganda, look at Ethiopia, uh, look at Cameroon, look at Chad. Uh, Chad seems to be holding the record in Africa right now for shutting down for over a year. Uh, but we hope that record, and uh, no one is planning to meet that record because let, let that record just, just die there. Uh, that was yesterday. And today we came to the most interesting topic for me. Uh, and the reason for that is because we're a very young continent. Uh, the median age in Africa is 19. We're talking about the fact that if we played our game right, Youth and technology is always a dynamic opportunity for any country uh, or even for any region. But for Africa, when a majority of that youth population is not employed, then don't be surprised when you begin to find that it is easier for terrorists to recruit young people than to, for them to find a job. And I think that is not just a political crisis. That is not just a security problem. That is a major social economic problem that has to be solved. And guess what? One of the things as we've discussed today that can solve this is technology. So left to me, I would assume that it makes absolute sense for every African nation to begin to deploy a lot more resources towards connecting young people to opportunities through technology. But that's not the case in many countries. Uh, you have the universal services funds, which is basically uh, a fraction between one and two or 2.5% of profit after tax from telecom companies collected by many countries across the continent, which is supposed to help with last mile solution. So that somebody in Zara Baba in Kano in Nigeria does not have to travel to Lagos before he can find a job that can help him and the rest of his family. But those funds are not being used uh, for this exact purpose. And so, you know, when, but when you look at the numbers, uh, it's, it's a bit, uh, you know, there's a bit, there's a lot of room for optimism because if you look, even though only two, one in three people have internet access right now, uh, if you look back to just 30 years ago, well, not just uh, 30 years ago, uh, the number of internet, the percentage of internet users on the continent was 0 0.0001, you know, uh, and you can imagine that. You know, even between 2000 and 2021, in 21 years, we've had about 130 times the number of internet users that we had uh, in 2000, now in 2021. But it is still a sad fact that two 
out of three are still disconnected. I think that there's a lot of room for optimism, uh, which I've heard over the last few days, you know, in the polls, uh, when you look at the polls, you can be sure uh, that if someone is saying that in the face of the challenges, technology still presents a 96% uh, opportunity uh, to improve youth opportunities, then that is a lot of optimism. But I think the gap between optimism which is the potential of Africa and the reality that we all seek is where the work lies. And that work, as has been said earlier, lies with nation states. Yes, pressure can come from civil society. Yes, pressure can come from young people. Yes, pressure can come from you know, uh, the, the private sector. Yes, pressure can even come from regional institutions like the AU or ECOWAS or SADC or you know COMESA or any original institutions. But at the end of the day, we need political will uh, for many of those nation states to be able to translate potential into, well, as we will do in days of physics, potential into kinetic, but to turn all of those potential opportunities into reality. What you would see if you look at the ecosystem, the tech ecosystem on the continent, and I'll close with this. If you look at the tech ecosystem in Africa, uh, between 2001, when I you know got into the sector myself uh, as a fresh graduate, and now, 20 years, in 20 years, we've moved from where people had ideas and just had to go and work either in a bank or a telco, and the idea died, to so where people now out of school, have an idea, share the idea with someone else, look for investment, find investment, and build companies. Many of the you know tech startups across the continent, especially in Lagos, in Nigeria, in uh, in Kenya, in South Africa, and in, and in a few other countries, you've seen a lot of that. And all of this have happened in spite of supporting policies, in spite of enabling policies. So you can imagine what can happen if policy supported innovation and, and i think this is what i've heard uh, over the last three days from the various speakers from day one to yesterday onto today that there is hope there is optimism but something is missing and that is political will and deliberate action today an average young person is literally being told that it pays you to be a criminal than to be a graduate in many countries in many countries but we need to change that. And the way to change that, of course, is to reward hard work, but also to take advantage of technology. 2020, sad year in terms of, you know, many personal losses and colleagues and things like that. But a major lesson 2020 taught us is that technology can play a major role in bridging gaps. Nobody could work except remotely, right? Nobody could go to school except online. We now know. Technology is not just a nice to have. It is a prerequisite to the socioeconomic breakthrough that we need on the continent. And I look forward uh, to many of the speakers over the last few days, uh, many of the governments represented, and many of the governments who have represented, uh, you know, working together to make sure that we translate all of these things we've talked about, you know, we've talked about and been talking about into opportunities. We've seen these things happen. Many of the people that I spoke over the last three days, including myself, are testimonies to the fact that technology can change your story from someone who is headed for the bottom of the pyramid to someone who is able to confidently build a global career. Uh, thank you for the conversation. Thank you for the opportunity to, to listen before mm -hmm. speaking. I think it was very useful. Uh, and, and I look forward to you know, the action that will follow this.